really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. I'm glad you're here with me for another episode today. I'm going to be talking about spirituality with or without God. So this is a topic I've been wanting to discuss for quite a while now, so I'm a a little bit excited about it. And I'm sure some of you might feel confused. You might be wondering, how is it possible to have spirituality without God? Because isn't God the whole point of spirituality? And from the perspective of religion, that is true. Yes, God is is what spirituality is all about. But I'm here to tell you that we need to focus on spirituality with or without God. Those of us who don't believe in God, who've never connected with the idea that there is a God, and for whom it feels ridiculous in a way to believe in a God, still have a spiritual nature and a spiritual essence. All of us are spiritual beings, like it or not. So with or without God, we all have a spiritual nature that we need to tend to and grow throughout life. And that's why I want to talk about this subject. It came to my mind originally working in hospice because I would I would see patients who would say they did not want to have a conversation with the chaplain because they weren't religious and therefore they did not need a spiritual consult. And yet dying is a spiritual process, if anything. It is when we challenge our ego and our understanding of the meaning of life more than any other time in our existence. And that's a spiritual process. And so I came to believe all of our patients need spiritual connection and and spiritual guidance as they're dying, even if they don't believe in a God, they have no religion, no faith, and no use for any of that in their lives. They are still spiritual beings. So think of it this way. We know we are multidimensional beings. We're not just bodies. We have minds that are not tangible or, or something we can look at or touch or see. We're not just bodies with minds, we also have emotions that move us and affect our behavior. But again, we can only see the manifestation of our emotions, we can't look at the actual emotion itself. And so we're not just bodies with minds and emotions and egos, we also have consciousness. And our consciousness is what I would define as our spiritual essence. We know this because of of science, for one thing, is telling us that there is a consciousness that each of us contains or possesses or we're made of as individuals, but a consciousness that is shared amongst all living things as well. So when I talk about our spiritual nature, this is what I mean. If, If you don't like the word spirituality, think of consciousness as what we're talking about here and the fact that our own consciousness needs tending to and needs some some work throughout the process of our lives because consciousness has the ability to grow and expand, particularly if we pay attention to it. And that's the reason for this talk today is to encourage all of us to be thinking about our own consciousness and how we might grow to higher levels of consciousness, whether we include God or not in our practices and in the work that we do. So one thing we can look at is the word spirituality, which, as I also said, is probably triggering for some people. Some people, I'm sure, don't like the word and associate the word spirituality with religion, but they're very different things. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but I want to give you a new definition of spirituality and a new way of thinking of it, in addition to thinking of it as our consciousness. But 
Our spirituality is really how we care for and nurture our own spiritual essence, the intangible, what is beyond our awareness or our understanding about us, because we all know that there's something happening within us that we can't quite can't quite grasp. We don't quite understand what this is, that there is a part of us that somehow seems wiser than we are, that somehow seems to observe us and watch us and be aware of what's happening around us, but is mysterious to us. And that is our spiritual essence. The philosopher Paul Tillich has defined spirituality as our ultimate concern, whatever matters to us beyond everything else. And that's a really interesting definition of it. If you think about what is the most important thing to you in your life, if you were to lose everything else, what does it come down to is is the most important thing? What ultimately do you care about more than anything else? He says that is where our spirituality is made visible in that ultimate concern of ours. And so, as you can imagine, a person's ultimate concern might be the religion that they're a member of. It might be God or Jesus or Allah or Buddha. If they have had a personal experience, that might be their ultimate concern, but doesn't have to be. It could be anything. I've often told the story of a patient I worked with in hospice who was one of the people who refused a visit from a chaplain, had no interest in that, said he had never had any faith, had no belief in God whatsoever. But this man did have a deep love for baseball. So primarily the thing he wanted to talk about when we came to visit him was baseball. And he knew all sorts of statistics and facts about various teams. He had stories about games he had seen. He had his favorite team and favorite players that he would talk about endlessly. And our staff would get frustrated sometimes because the only thing he was willing to talk about was baseball. He didn't want to talk about about facing the end of life, about what that would mean for him. He didn't want to work on tying up loose ends or making amends or reconnecting with his wife and son, whom he had been estranged from for years and years. He had no interest in that. Baseball was the only thing he would talk to us about. And finally, we came to the realization that baseball is his ultimate concern. And and we were all worried, like he's not dealing with any of the spiritual issues around death and dying. But once we understood that baseball was his ultimate concern, we were able to let him just talk about baseball. And I remember visiting him This was one of my first visits to him, and after the staff had already been (laughs) pulling their hair out a little bit because he would, would only talk about baseball, and I knew very little about it, but decided, all right, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to listen and learn about baseball today. So I spent my one hour visit with him learning all about baseball and just listening and listening and trying my best to have a conversation about baseball, and finally... At the end of that discussion, he got a tear in his eye and he said, you know what I've always regretted? Uh, I left my wife when my son was really young and I never got to take him to a baseball game. And so right there, by focusing in on this man's ultimate concern and allowing it to be baseball, because that's what it appeared to be, we were able to go deeper with him and to actually get to that the deeper meaning and the deeper issues for him that he was harboring and perhaps covering up and hiding from himself and he finally acknowledged it and talked a little bit about the pain of his divorce and his estrangement from his wife and son so In the end, eventually by going through the doorway of baseball, we were able to help him with that spiritual task of forgiveness, forgiving himself, of in a sense, 
making peace with his past and with the choices he had made. We were able to get there, but we needed to go through baseball first to get to that point because baseball was his ultimate concern. So I tell this story a lot when I'm talking to hospice workers who say, oh no, we didn't send in the chaplain because this person isn't isn't religious or spiritual, so they didn't want the chaplain. But I talked to them about the fact that everyone, regardless of their beliefs, needs to have an opportunity to love and to forgive at the end of their lives. And those are spiritual tasks. And so maybe some people reject spiritual teachers or leaders coming to speak with them because they they are repelled by the idea of spirituality and religion. But each one of us needs to have a bigger view of what spirituality is so that we can be the person who can sit and listen to stories about baseball, so that we can be the person who can maintain a sacred space if whether it's baseball or sewing or gardening or whatever happens to be the ultimate concern for the people we come into contact with and we need to accept that they're sharing with us their ultimate concern whatever it is is a sacred and spiritual act for them. And when we can hold present presence with that person as they share, then we are helping them heal themselves spiritually and grow spiritually, whether we ever talk about spirituality or not at all. And we don't need to ask them to change their beliefs or suddenly have some awakening. We simply need to be present for them. So that's my introduction in a way to why we need to understand this concept that you don't have to believe in God or have any room in your life for God at all in order to be spiritual. And you don't have to talk about God or ask people to accept a God in order to help them with their spiritual nature when you're working with them at the end of life and also for ourselves when we want to work on ourselves and we want to expand our own consciousness we can do it with or without God depending on where we are on our journeys so from there I want to talk a little bit uh, about the idea of stages of growth in consciousness, various levels that we as human beings attain in our consciousness, uh, depending on where we are and who we are, what experiences we're exposed to in life. And this comes loosely from the work of Ken Wilber, his integral theory. So um, apologies, because I'm really, really compressing and shortening this information. Ken has written extensively about it. And if you find it fascinating, you would probably love reading some of his books. But I'm going to talk about just three levels, though there are many others. Because here in the US, and in most of Western society, these three levels are the predominant three levels of consciousness with of people within our society. And you will probably recognize that as I describe the levels. The first level is known as the traditional or tribal level. And this is a level of consciousness at which people uh, as it's as it says tribal people tend to be comfortable being members of a group and receiving their identity and their belief system from the group they belong to so that group might be a religion that people choose to follow and they accept the dogma of the religion and the teachings that are given to them by an authority a person of authority within that religion. So that's one type of tribal or traditional expression of consciousness at that level. Um, but someone also, they might be part of a corporation or they might be a member of a, a group, like a, a social group, uh, like the Rotary Club or the Elks Club, where in the same way they are a member and they adhere themselves to the rules and the beliefs of the group to which they belong. Some people at this level are part of the military. Some people at this level might also 
might identify strongly with a sports team or with a school that they've attended or with their state they live in, their, their community they live in, or the nation that they live in. Uh, but the hallmark of this traditional tribal level is that it's about being a member and it's about being one of many, but subsuming your personal identity to the identity of the group that you've chosen to belong to and to also have your beliefs defined for you and leadership defined for you outside of yourself by other people that you give authority to and that you respect in that group. So the good things about this level are that it teaches us humility and also loyalty and how to work together with other people, how to follow instructions. And so there's a lot of very positive characteristics that come from this level, but you can also see some of the problems here are people are less likely to think for themselves and make their own decisions, even though they might believe they are making their own decisions, but they're less likely to do their own research, to learn things on their own, and less likely to veer away from the beliefs that they've been told are the right beliefs to have. They're much less likely to choose information outside of that particular pattern of beliefs. So that is the traditional or tribal level of consciousness. The next level is the rational level of consciousness, which is a dramatic change from the tribal level. At the rational level, it's, it's a much more individualistic level where a person suddenly recognizes, wait a minute, I don't want to be part of that group anymore because I'm totally different. I have different ideas than that. I, I've learned some things. I can think for myself. I want to make my own decisions and I want to be the master of my own life and my own fate. So at the rational level, many people who've been, who were hap happily part of a religion when they were at the traditional or tribal level of consciousness suddenly can no longer tolerate that. They cannot continue to be members of the religion. They simply have to walk away from it because they see the world differently now through this rational lens. The rational level of consciousness is responsible for our legal system, for science and medicine, for growth in things that we can observe and measure and witness. And it's also a time of, of coming to coming into your own in a sense of coming to see yourself as different than other people and also to value yourself in that way and to want to secure rights for yourself, to want to be able to have your place and to see that as an individual, you are just as important as anyone else. So the rational level can be somewhat selfish and self-centered as people are making sure they have what they need and less likely to turn over any authority to to anyone outside of them, they're asking questions about everything and beginning to look within themselves for answers. So as you can see, some really good things come from the rational level as well, the ability to, to use critical thinking, to analyze, to make informed decisions, also to care about fairness and justice for making laws that make sense and adhering to principles that, that make sense in the world that have a rational basis. Many people at the rational level, as I meant, me, uh, mentioned before, give up whatever religion they had adhered to during the tribal stage of consciousness. So many people at the rational level uh, call themselves atheists or agnostics. And so... One issue that we see here is that because science and medicine arise from this rational level of consciousness, there is a conflict with people who are in the traditional and tribal phase who rely more on belief in a source of power outside of them 
um, that is mysterious and all powerful to them. When people at the rational level suddenly say, well, that's not even true. Here's what is true. Science, we can measure it, we can study it, that this is what's true, not what you believe in. The limitation at the rational level is not being able to see what is beyond science and to see that to believe that science somehow is the is the highest form of knowing that there is and so that's where the conflict arises between rational and tribal or traditional levels when we move beyond rational the next level the third level which is prevalent in our society as well is called the pluralistic level uh, or the sensitive level and at this level of consciousness people are turning a bit away from just focusing on themselves as individuals and experiencing caring for others outside of them. So care for the planet, care for the world, care for others around the world who are being harmed. So this pluralistic idea is that there's a desire to look out for others rather than primarily to look out for me or myself, but a desire to see that that there's a connection with others and a need to help and care for others. At the pluralistic level, what I've observed is that some people continue with uh, very strong rational beliefs and have a very strong belief in science, but they also have a newfound sensitivity toward other groups of people and new caring about others and a desire to see t- uh, fairness and compassion extended toward other groups of people, particularly those who are disenfranchised or some somehow being disadvantaged by society. Within this pluralistic level, however, there is also a newfound sense of spirituality. And this is where new age spirituality fits in, in a way of people exploring their own consciousness of adopting other ideas uh, way beyond the religion they may have rejected a couple of levels ago, um, exploring multiple types of religion and spiritual practices and working to develop their own consciousness at this level. And so sometimes there are conflicts within the pluralistic level because the people who believe in science are less likely to endorse these spiritual pursuits of the people who believe in New Age spirituality. And New Age people may be likely to reject science because they've they've turned away from the science of their previous level in order to go back to different forms of spirituality that have meaning for them. So I've described these three different levels, traditional, tribal, rational, or pluralistic, all of which exist right now in our society, and all of which conflict with one another in our society. So that's something that's happening right now. And you may be able to look back at your own life and see where you are in your own growth. Most of the people listening to a podcast like this, I would think are probably at the pluralistic level because, uh, and, and the pluralistic toward the more spiritual side. But I do want to put out there that you may be a person with a strong rational bent, again, who doesn't believe in God and doesn't need to believe in God or want to believe in God. But it's so important that you understand that you are still a spiritual being. And so partly why I'm putting these podcasts out there and talking about these lessons for the ego and the spiritual lessons to learn from the dying is because these are important lessons that we each of us needs in order to help us grow and expand our own level of consciousness as much as possible. So there's another concept that I've learned from Ken Wilbur that's important to know here, which is called the set point. And Ken teaches that each of us is born with a set point for our our consciousness. And that is the level that we are kind of um, predestined to attain during our lifetime. And we get there fairly easily. So 
as we grow through different stages of development uh, in our youth and adolescence, we we grow in consciousness until we reach our set point and we don't have to do anything in particular to get there. That's just where we arrive. So you will see some people who uh, in their, you know, in their early teens become affiliated with a religion and have a very strong and devout connection to that religion. And that might be where their set point is. But you'll see others who go through that phase of being part of a religion and pretty easily at a certain age of the age of reason, as we say, decide that's not for me. I'm leaving that behind. And without a lot of effort or struggle are able to just walk away and move on to the rational level. And then a little bit later in life, we may see people who very easily move into the pluralistic phase for whom it almost comes naturally to be thinking about the planet and other beings on the planet and how can we best care for one another. So each of us has our set point that, as I said, we arrive there fairly easily without a lot of effort or work. It's it's where our consciousness has been programmed in a way by our DNA and by our soul, if whether you believe in that or not. But that's where we, where we arrive on our own without putting forth a lot of effort. It is possible that our, our growth to our set point could be stunted if we grow up in very traumatic or difficult circumstances that don't nurture us or support us in getting to our set point. But most of us in the West have grown up in situations where we're able to reach our set point without too much difficulty. To go beyond our set point, and this is what I am talking about here and why I talk about this because there are many of us who may feel a desire to grow and learn beyond the set point that we've reached. It takes work to grow past the set point. We have to put forth effort if we're going to grow. And it might be that we, we, develop the desire for growth because of something traumatic that happens in our life, something that wakes us up, perhaps an illness or an injury or a loss, or maybe we meet a person that inspires us in a way we've never been inspired before. And we just desire to grow to become more like that person. It it could be any type of experience that might awaken us to this desire to grow. And that's where the work of spirituality comes into play. And why what I'm writing about what I what I write about and talk about is to help people who are at that place of wanting to grow spiritually but not wanting to return to a religion in order to get guidance or direction. And for some, not wanting to have to believe in a God if they're not ready for that or if that doesn't sound right to them in order to find their way toward higher consciousness. So as I said, this is the whole point of of the work that I'm doing right now is to help people see how to move beyond your own spiritual set point, how to expand your consciousness, how to grow no matter where you are right now, and and how to, to grow into your best self, your best and highest self. There's no right or wrong way to get there. And there is no definition of what your best and highest self should be like. That's unique to you. So I can't even tell you where you're growing to or what you're heading toward. I can only tell you what I've learned about some of the practices that you can work on to help you grow. So the point is to go within yourself and work on your own inner life. Look at your own shadow. Where have you been wounded? Where are you carrying pain and anger and resentment? Those are issues that need to be worked on and healed so that you can grow in consciousness. And so that would be the first lesson that I talk about, which is your ability to deal with suffering, because you really do have to be able to go into your own pain. 
that's where you need healing. That's where you need growth. And you have to learn how to understand it and how do you embrace it and live with the pain of your life and in a, live in a positive way, sort of a forward looking way with a willingness to find whatever meaning is within your pain and how can you make the best of whatever life has given you. And so the next lesson, these are all my seven lessons that you'll recognize. <clears throat> the next lesson is how much love are you able to give and receive in the world? And, and perhaps I should say it the other way around. How much love can you receive? How much can you love yourself? How can you grow your ability to love yourself so that you can love others? Because the more you're able to heal yourself, heal your shadow, the greater the self-love you are able to carry, and therefore, the more love you're able to transmit and bring to the world. So learning how to love is a huge step. And for each one of us, we often have to recognize first how little we love ourselves and how hard it is to love ourselves. And that can be the work of a lifetime, simply to figure out how do I, how am I going to love myself? The moment you love yourself even a tiny bit more than you have in the past, you will already be loving other people and sharing that love with other people. So love is, is the very next lesson to work on. Following love, we have to work on our skills in forgiveness and in living in the present moment. So forgiveness goes hand in hand with love. We have to be able to forgive ourselves and forgive other people and forgive life for the difficulties that have come to us. That's the only way we can grow in deeper and greater love is by forgiving because that's how we let go of the wounds and the pain and the baggage that we're carrying within us. So when we forgive, we release all of that old stuck energy inside of us and we make space for more love. We can carry more love for ourselves and therefore for others as well. And then learning to be in the present moment. It's another skill that you have to work on and develop. How do I bring my attention to whatever is happening in my life right now so that I'm fully here, engaged with life, savoring it, taking it in, enjoying it or suffering with it, whatever is coming my way? How can I be here fully engaged in life so that I'm living it as fully as possible? Next, we work on understanding the higher purpose of life, which oftentimes has nothing to do with what we've spent our whole lives believing is our, our career path or, uh, you know, our, our choice of what we wish to create in the world. Sometimes there's a higher purpose that, that we've been unaware of that's happening all along, things that we're learning and ways that we're healing ourselves, which is more the purpose that we're here for than we, than we can even recognize in earlier stages. Then we have to learn to let go of our attachments. And these attachments are primarily to how we think life should be, what we think should happen, or what we think we should receive, or how we wish things would turn out. We have to let go of all of those attachments because they hold us back. They cause us to make choices that are not always in our best interest. And once we begin to let go of those attachments, we relax a little bit into to this energetic flow of life and we begin to let life come and go as it chooses and we begin to allow new things to come into our lives and that's when we are truly at the point where we're capable of growing fairly quickly when we're able to let go of those attachments. And then the final lesson, lesson number seven, is to accept that nothing lasts and everything changes. And this is the lesson we just talked last week about the lesson the ego needs to learn, which is that you are going to die. And so this is the, the seventh of the seven lessons that I talk about is the ability to understand that Life is short and fleeting. We're only here for a moment and we have to make the most of of that moment, whatever we have. And we can't spend our time being upset or angry that life is short. 
we have to live within that space of a life that that may not even be here in the next moment, may not be here tomorrow. We have to live within that space of uncertainty, but still love every moment of it and live it to the fullest. So those are the seven spiritual lessons I talk about and why they're important. But as you can see, None of them have to involve God if you are not comfortable with the concept of a God. If you are, though, and if if you have a connection that you call God, a, a connection to something higher, something divine, um, the universe or spirit that you call God and you're comfortable with the idea of God, then this is all about getting closer to God and expanding your consciousness to understand more about God. But it doesn't have to be. We all still need to grow in our consciousness with or without God. And these seven lessons are one of the ways to focus on that. You can leave God out entirely and simply work on yourself, your own ability to love and forgive and be present without ever even talking or thinking about God and whether or not there is a God. And it's perfectly fine to do that because you will be honoring your own level of consciousness. You'll be starting where you are and you'll be accepting where you are and even celebrating that. Like, this is how it looks to me right now. This is what I know and what I'm aware of. And that's the perfect place to start, whether it includes God or not. And whether you ever, you don't ever need to have an understanding of God if that isn't the right thing for you, if that isn't destined for you or meant for you on your path of consciousness. So I encourage you if you're someone who has decided that, that you can't have a belief in God, you have to leave that aside. And I think it's actually really important if if you're making the step from tribal traditional consciousness to rational, I think it actually is important to leave aside all of those beliefs for a while because you're trying to grow your own understanding and your own intuition, your own knowledge, your own wisdom, and being too attached to what was told to you and taught to you before can slow you down and impede you from hearing your own guidance and understanding your own wisdom. Um, Just don't leave aside your own spirituality. Recognize that your growth lies in, in seeing yourself as a spiritual being. You have this amazing, beautiful essence about you that you can continue to develop and nurture all throughout the rest of your life. And you can let it grow however it grows and go in whatever direction it goes. So that's my hope that you'll feel inspired to keep learning and keep growing. If you haven't yet listened to my earlier episodes of the podcast where I talked about these seven lessons, suffering, love, forgiveness, presence, purpose, surrender, and impermanence, please go back and listen to them because each episode contains ideas for practices and things that you can do to help you work on these seven lessons. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't even happen in one lifetime, really. It takes a lot of work to grow, but you can get started wherever you are right now. So I hope this resonates with some of you out there, spirituality with or without God and wherever you find yourself. I hope that you are able to experience and receive more and more love every day so that you can share it with the rest of the world because the world desperately needs whatever love you can carry and bring to it right now. So I'll be back next week with another topic to discuss with you. Meanwhile, you're welcome to leave a voice message if you'd like for me on this podcast. And until we're together again the next time, remember that we're here for love. Love is really the key to all of this. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life brings your way next, and love each and every moment of your precious life. Bye-bye.